we need to define this big family of infinite ordinals, the ordinals up to epsilon zero. That means we need to say what these ordinals are. We'll actually be able to write down a name for each of these ordinals. We also need a way to compare ordinals. The ordinals are supposed to be ordered, so we need to know when one ordinal is less than another. It turns out we can get all the ordinals we want using just two operations. When alpha is an ordinal below epsilon zero, we'll also have an ordinal which we call omega to the alpha, which will also be an ordinal below epsilon zero, and we'll have this addition operation which we write with a hash sign. Whenever we have two ordinals, we can add them to get another ordinal. And it turns out that if we start with zero, these two operations give us all the ordinals we want. Since we have zero, we also have omega to the zero, which is the ordinal we usually call one. And since we have one, we have one plus one and one plus one plus one, and so on. Also, since we have one, we have omega to the one, which we often just call omega without an exponent. And we also have omega to the one plus one and omega to the one plus one plus one. And we can also add all these ordinals. We have omega to the one plus one, omega to the one plus omega to the one, omega to the one plus one plus omega to the one, omega to the one plus one plus one, and so on. And then, since we have all these ordinals, we can put them in exponents and get more ordinals. We have omega to the omega to the one plus one plus one, and omega to the omega to the one plus one plus omega to the one plus one. And then we can add these to get omega to the omega to the one plus one plus omega to the one plus one plus omega to the omega to the one plus one plus one, and then exponents again, so we get omega to the, that long ordinal we just wrote, and so on. And that's the complete list of ordinals below epsilon zero. They're built inductively by starting with zero, and then taking ordinals alpha and beta that we've already found, and adding the ordinals omega to the alpha and alpha plus beta. Next, we need a way to order these ordinals. We need to say when one of these ordinals is bigger than another of these ordinals. To do that, we need to think a little about the structure of our ordinals. Notice that there are exactly three kinds of ordinals. There's zero, which is a kind by itself. There's ordinals like omega to the alpha, exponents. And there's sums, ordinals like alpha plus beta. When we look at a sum, if either part were zero, we would just drop it. Alpha plus zero is the same ordinal as alpha. And if one of the parts is itself a sum, we could think of this ordinal as being a sum of more than two ordinals. If beta is gamma plus delta, then alpha plus beta is also alpha plus gamma plus delta. So when we have a sum of ordinals, we can just keep expanding it until it's a finite sum, maybe of many pieces, but none of the pieces is zero, and none of the pieces is a sum, which means each of the pieces is an exponent. So every sum has the form omega to the alpha 1 plus omega to the alpha 2 plus dot 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 plus omega to the alpha k. If we think of exponents as being the case where k equals 1, we can say that every ordinal is either 0 or it has the form omega to the alpha 1 plus omega to the alpha 2 plus dot 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 plus omega to the alpha k. When k equals 1, we're talking about an exponent. When k is more than 1, it's a sum. In fact, if you really want a description with no cases, you could say that 0 is the ordinal which is the sum of no pieces. So 0 is the sum where k equals 0. And then every ordinal fits into this form. You can see from this why we have addition and exponentiation, but no multiplication. If we wanted to multiply by a finite number, we just add multiple times. So instead of omega squared times 3, we have omega squared plus omega squared plus omega squared. And multiplication by infinite numbers turns into adding exponents. Instead of writing omega to the alpha times omega squared, we would write omega to the alpha plus 2, and so on. So using multiplication wouldn't build any new ordinals. It would just give us redundant names for the ordinals we already found. So how do we compare ordinals? Zero is definitely the smallest ordinal. Every other ordinal is greater than zero. So we only need to worry about comparing two ordinals written as sums. We have two ordinals, 
alpha is omega to the alpha 1 plus omega to the alpha 2 plus dot 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 omega to the alpha k, and beta is omega to the beta 1 plus omega to the beta 2 plus dot 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 omega to the beta r, and we want to know which one is bigger. Since the ordinals are built inductively, we started with 0 and built the ordinals up. The ordinals alpha i and beta i are simpler than the ordinals alpha and beta. So we're going to assume that we've already figured out how to compare the simpler ordinals, how to compare the exponents. In particular, we follow a convention. When we write an ordinal this way, as a sum of exponential terms, we always write the terms from biggest to smallest. We have alpha 1 is greater than or equal to alpha 2 is greater than or equal to alpha 3, and so on. And beta 1 is greater than or equal to beta 2, and so on. So we wouldn't usually write omega squared plus omega to the 305 plus omega. We'd rewrite that to omega to the 305 plus omega squared plus omega. Remember, omega is really omega to the 1. So it's the same ordinal, but it's written in our canonical way, in our following our convention. We need to say greater than or equal in this convention because we do allow repeated terms. 2, which is 1 plus 1, is a valid ordinal. It's really omega to the 0 plus omega to the 0, and that's fine because 0 is greater than or equal to 0. And the way we compare these ordinals is that we start by looking at the first exponent, the largest exponent. So if alpha 1 is bigger than beta 1, then alpha is bigger than beta. And if beta 1 is bigger than alpha 1, then beta is bigger. For example, omega to the omega plus omega to the 1 is larger than omega to the 305 plus omega to the 305 plus omega to the 304 plus omega to the 304 plus 2. As soon as we see that omega is bigger than 305, we know that omega to the omega plus omega to the 1 is the larger ordinal. Even though the second ordinal has lots of terms, they're all small. They're all at most omega to the 305, so no amount of adding them together is going to catch up with that omega to the omega. If alpha 1 and beta 1 are equal, then we go on to the next term. Then, if alpha 2 is bigger than beta 2, then alpha is bigger, and if beta 2 is bigger than alpha 2, then beta is bigger. For example, if we compare omega to the omega plus omega to the 15 plus omega to the 15 with omega to the omega plus omega to the 16, the second ordinal, omega to the omega plus omega to the 16, is the bigger one. The first terms are equal, so we go on to the second term, and since 16 is bigger than 15, the second ordinal is bigger. And this just keeps going. If alpha 2 is also equal to beta 2, then we compare alpha 3 with beta 3. And to say this more generally, we look for the smallest index i so that alpha i is not equal to beta i. And if, for that i, alpha i is greater, then alpha is the larger ordinal, and if beta i is bigger, then beta is the larger ordinal. For example, to compare omega to the omega plus omega plus omega to the omega plus omega to the omega plus omega to the 6 plus omega to the 4 plus omega to the 1 with omega to the omega to the omega plus omega to the omega plus omega to the omega plus omega to the 6 plus omega to the 6 plus 1. We compare the first terms, which are equal, so we go on to the second terms, which are equal, and to the third terms, and we keep going. And finally, at the fifth term, 6 is bigger than 4, so the second ordinal is the bigger one. But what if we run out of terms? What if we compare all the terms and they're all the same? In that case, we just say that the longer ordinal is the bigger one. For instance, if we compare omega to the omega plus omega cubed plus 1 with omega to the omega plus omega cubed, we see that the first terms are equal, so we go to the second term. The second terms are equal, and then one of the ordinals has run out. It doesn't have a third term, so the longer ordinal is the bigger one. And that is what we expect, because the longer sum is literally the shorter sum plus additional stuff, so of course it's bigger than the shorter one. So to say that formally, when we compare two ordinals, we look for the smallest i, such that alpha i is not equal to beta i, and of course i has to be less than both k and r in order for us to be able to talk about alpha i and beta i. If there's no such i, that means alpha i is equal to beta i for every i up to the smaller of k and r. And in that case, if k is bigger r than r, then alpha is bigger. And if r is bigger than k, then beta is bigger. And of course, if also k is equal to r, then these are the same ordinal. They're identical lists of terms, so they're equal. And that is, more or less, a definition. It's written down in a slightly more formal way in the companion notes, 
but this is everything we need to write down the ordinals we care about. Epsilon zero is the name of the next ordinal, an ordinal bigger than everything we've talked about, but we don't really need this ordinal. We're only gonna mention it as a quick way to name the ordinals we do care about. We'll just say the ordinals less than epsilon zero. The main thing we promised, the whole point of this, is that the ordinals are supposed to be well-founded. In the next video, we'll actually prove that. But if you're satisfied that it's true, or you'd rather just read the proof in the notes, you can skip on to the video after that, where we finally connect these ordinals back to the Goodstein sequences.